optimal minimal. At this altitude, I can run flat out for a half mile before my hands start shaking. Can I answer your personal question? Now it is in the perfect time. What if I did the opposite? I'm a cybernetic organism, living tissue over metal endoskeleton. This episode is brought to you by 99designs, your one-stop shop for all things graphic design related. I have used 99designs for everything from banner ads to book covers, including sketches and mock-ups that led to The 4-Hour Body, which later became number one New York Times, number one Wall Street Journal. And the brainstorming, a lot of it took place with designers from around the world. And here's how it works. Whether you need a t-shirt, a business card, a website, an app thumbnail, whatever it might be, you submit that project and designers from around the world will send you sketches and mock-ups and designs. You choose your favorite and you have an original that you love or you get your money back. It's that straightforward. And many of you who are listening have already used it and created some amazing things that I'll be sharing in the future. But in the meantime, if you want to see some of my competitions, some of the book covers, as well as get a free $99 upgrade, go to 99designs.com forward slash Tim. That's 99designs.com forward slash Tim. The Tim Ferriss Show is brought to you by Onnit. I have used Onnit products for years. If you look in my kitchen, in my garage, you will find Alpha Brain, chewable melatonin for resetting my clock when I'm traveling, kettlebells, battle ropes, maces, steel clubs. It sounds like a torture chamber, and it kind of is. It's a torture chamber for self-improvement. <laughs> and you can see all of my favorite gear at onnit.com forward slash Tim. That's O-N-N-I-T dot com forward slash Tim. And you can also get a discount on any supplements, food products. I like Hemp Force. I like Alpha Brain. Check it all out on it.com forward slash Tim. Guten Tag, my sexy little munchkins. This is Tim Ferriss in a very echo laden wooden room on an island. And we'll be hearing more about that in a future episode with Chris Saka. But in the meantime, I am so excited to present an episode that was very, very physically demanding. And this conversation you're about to listen to is with none other than Rick Rubin. And if you don't recognize that name, well, the bio could seem almost fabricated. It is so impressive. So he has been called the most important producer, that's music producer of the last 20 years by MTV. And in 2007, he appeared on Time's 100 Most Influential People in the World list. Why would he appear on such a list? Well, if you could imagine, say, in the book world, that you named every author you could think of off the top of your head, all the name brand folks, and then found out that one agent and one editor were responsible for all of them, you'd be dumbfounded. And that's pretty much the case when you look at the discography of Rick Rubin. So he was the former co-president of Columbia Records. He was co-founder, along with Russell Simmons, of Def Jam Records, and helped to popularize hip-hop music by working with the Beastie Boys, L. Hello, cool J, Public Enemy, Run DMC, for instance. And I'm not going to give the whole list because it's too long, but here are just some of the artists that he has worked with. Red Hot Chili Peppers, Beastie Boys, which I already mentioned, Johnny Cash, Slayer, Jay-Z, and he appeared in the 99 Problems video, Danzig, Dixie Chicks, Tom Petty and the Heartbreakers, Black Sabbath, Slipknot, Metallica, ACDC, Aerosmith, Linkin Park, Weezer, <laughs> The Cult, Neil Diamond, uh, Mick Jagger, System of a Down, it goes on and on. And the genres span from, say, Lady Gaga to ZZ Top to Shakira and everything in between, Kanye West, Eminem, you name it. So he's a fascinating guy, uh, very much a Zen monk in his temperament. And I've gotten to know Rick over the last few years. And he insisted that we do the podcast in his sauna, which is a barrel sauna that makes your head melt. It is so intense. So this is a very challenging episode. I hope you get some laughs out of it. And uh, what you will realize very quickly is you have to listen intently to Rick's answers. So Rick has sort of layers behind layers behind layers. So he'll tell you something and you're like, wow, I'm not sure I actually get what that means. And then months later, it'll dawn on you. Oh my God, there are so many different depths to that answer. I didn't pick up on it the first time around. So uh, you will have to interpret and ponder a lot of what Rick brings up, but I hope you enjoy this. Uh, I enjoyed it, although I nearly had heat stroke. And without further ado, here is Rick Rubin. 
Well, well, almost without further ado, folks, one more ado. I forgot to mention, if you are interested in music, be sure to check out the drumming episode of the Tim Ferriss Experiment, which is my TV show. It's been the number one TV season on iTunes now for some time, amazingly. But if you go to iTunes.com forward slash Tim Ferriss, two R's, two S's, you can see a bunch of bonus footage, all the episodes, including the drumming episode, where I am trained by Stuart Copeland, the founding drummer of The Police, widely considered one of the top 10 drummers of all time. His teaching method resembles Doc from Back to the Future. It is an amazing experience, and I only had a few days with the gun against my head to train to then play to a sold-out auditorium as the drummer for Foreigner, uh, which was a uh, nervous breakdown-inducing, to say the least. So you can check it out, itunes.com forward slash Tim Ferriss, two R's and two S's. And now, here is Rick Rubin. Rick, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. And this setting is somewhat unique, and I've been looking forward to it slash fearing it ever since you first mentioned it to me. Uh, where are we right now? Uh, we are sitting in a sauna. We are sitting in a very hot barrel sauna, and I was told that was one of the conditions for having this conversation. And it's uh, such an impressive barrel sauna. It's indoors that I wanted to get the specs for it when I first saw it. And you have a heater that has to be, what, four times the size of the off-the-shelf heater that would go into such a heater. Yeah, it's, a, it's, it's a much bigger heater than for the size of the room that we're in. <laughs> and I'm sitting on the floor because I have such little confidence in my ability to withstand heat compared to you. <laughs> but we do have the the alternate, which is the bath just outside of this door. And uh, you and I have gone back and forth, of course, quite a few times with this type of cycling, but what is right outside of this door? A metal tub filled with ice. It is a metal tub about four feet, three and a half feet off the ground, full of ice. Uh, it looks like, if you were to say, what, a, a horse trough times two, something like that. Something like that. <laughs> it's got to be maximum low 50s, something like that. I think it's about, today it's probably about 38 degrees. Oh, my God. All right. So we have a we have two mics on the floor I'm hoping won't explode or melt down. We have the H4 and the, and the H6, and we have uh, water, ice, heat. Nothing could go wrong. I'm looking forward to it. So, Rick, I was, uh, I was hoping perhaps we could start with uh, a discussion of your physical transformation. And I'd love for you to perhaps just describe to people, I mean, you're in my mind, the sort of the, the picture of, of fitness in a lot of ways now, and we've been paddle boarding before and you summarily whoop my ass every time we go out. I'm always impressed. <laughs> <laughs> there are a lot of things contributing to my, my lack of competency and fear there, but, uh, where, where were you and how did you end up undergoing this, this physical transformation? Because you've lost how much weight at this point? How much fat, fat are you um, saying? I lost... At, at the peak moment, I lost uh, between 135 and 140 pounds. And I always thought I was eating a healthy diet. I was vegan for 20-something years. And um, all organic, vegan, really, you know, very strict with what I ate. And doing that, I got up to 318 pounds. Um and I, I read a book by a guy named Stu Middleman who ran a thousand miles in 11 days. And I remember reading that and just thinking, wow, it's like I can barely walk down the block. And this guy ran a thousand miles in 11 days. And it just seems so inspiring. So I read his book. And in the book, he talked about a guy named Phil Maffetone, who I'd never heard of before. And he said, in Stu's book, he gets to the part where he said, well, I met this doctor, Phil Maffetone, and he changed the way I trained, and he changed the way I ate, and he changed all these things. And then all of a sudden, I was able to do all these things. It's like, okay, I want to find Phil Maffetone. So um, I, I found him online. I sent him an email, and he was um, living in Florida. And I asked if, if you know, I could become his patient. And he said that uh, he had just stopped treating patients and retired from being a doctor. It's like, that's terrible news. <laughs> and, um, but the reason he decided to stop being a doctor was he decided to become a songwriter. And I said, Oh, it's interesting. I'm, I'm involved. Funny you should mention that. Yeah. It's like, I'm involved in songwriting and, and the music world. Maybe we can trade. Maybe I can help you with your songwriting and you can help me with my health and fitness. 
and he liked the idea and we ended up meeting a few months later and then um, met several times and became friends and then he eventually ended up moving into my house and lived in my house for about two years and um, I did everything he said and I got much healthier my metabolism got turned on um, the hours that I was sleeping shifted I for most of my life I stayed up all night and slept most of the day and uh, when I was in college, I never took a class before 3 p.m. because I knew I wouldn't I wouldn't go. And this was at NYU? At NYU. So I'm used to living a night lifestyle. Even I, I remember even in high school, I missed, I missed the first three classes of school so many times that, you know, it was really an issue. But it was just I learned to be up on, I learned to be a late night person. And, um, and it kind of suited the music life, it's like it worked well with my life. Um, and one of the first things that Phil suggested when we got together was, um, I slept with blackout blinds and I usually didn't leave the house until the sun was setting. And he said, from now on, when you wake up, I want you to go outside. Oh, as soon as you wake up, open the blinds and go outside naked if possible and be in the sun for 20 minutes. And when he said it, I remember thinking he, it'd be the same as him saying, I want you to jump off this, this ledge. You know, like it sounded like the most terrifying, <laughs> based on the way I lived my life, that just sounded terrible. Right. Um, what time was he recommending that you wake up? Well, for, he, by the time we started, it, it kept moving down and it, and it, um, <clears throat> it went from three o'clock to probably noon to 11 to nine and it just sort of happened naturally and he knew that if i immediately went in the sun that naturally my body would want to start waking up earlier and going to sleep earlier I, I, it was the first time ever that my circadian rhythm was kicking in it never was i never knew that there was such a thing or knew what that was so he um he got me to connect to that and i did everything he said changed my diet, started eating some animal protein. I was, as I said, a devout vegan. So eggs and fish were the first things that I would eat. And even then I never liked eggs and I never liked fish. So I ate them more like medicine. Um, and slowly I got healthier and healthier and healthier and, um, more and more fit, but I was still very heavy and I was heavy for a long time. What age were you when you brought him into your house? Uh, or how long ago was this? Yeah, I'm going to guess... I'm going to guess... I was probably... Late 30s. And how... If you don't mind me asking. Yeah, how old like you 10 years ago. 10, 12, years ago. 10, 12 years ago. Something like that. Mm -hmm. So you, you were changing your diet. What were some of the other things that uh, he had you change... That he had me do um, 20 minutes of uh, low heart rate exercise, aerobic activity every day. And um, he had me start wearing a heart rate monitor. And my heart rate, I would get into, you know, for me, walking up a flight of stairs would be an aerobic activity. So I had to really watch what I was doing to, to stay. Or, or I, so an, anaerobic. an anaerobic activity, yeah. So I had to work hard to stay in the anaerobic space or the aerobic space you mean in the oh. aerobic space I'm sorry. <laughs> below that it's getting hot threshold. in here yeah, it's getting hot in here <laughs> time to take off all my, your clothes my hands <laughs> my hands burning holding the mic i tried to wrap them in, in napkins i remember you did did mention those might get hot but sorry i digress so to stay within the aerobic threshold you had to yes. work very hard yes and uh Again, my health changed, but I still stayed very heavy. And after two years of time, um, I probably I'd probably lost a little bit of weight, but not much. But I was much healthier and much more alive and much better than I was before. And after that period of time, Phil said to me, you know, anyone else who made the changes you made out of everyone he's ever dealt with, 99% out of 100 people, you know, 99 out of 100 people would have dropped all their weight. For some reason, there's something else going on with you that's holding on to the weight. So, and so I just, 
accepted that that's how it was. But at least I felt I felt a lot better. My life was a lot better. I was a lot happier. Um, and then I uh, a, a mentor of mine whose name is Mo Austin. He's a guy who ran Warner Brothers Records for thirty five years. He worked for Frank Sinatra. Real inspiring guy in the music business. Um, <clears throat> he suggested, I went out to lunch with him one day and he said, you know, Rick, I'm really worried about you. I know you watch what you eat and I know that you, you know, uh, walk on the beach every day and exercise, um, but you're really getting big and I'm worried. So <clears throat> he said, uh, I'm going to get the name of a nutritionist and I want you to go to my guy and I want you to do whatever he says. And I said, okay, fine. Like, I, and I knew it wouldn't work because I knew that my whole life I had a weight problem. My whole life, I've tried every diet and nothing ever worked. And, um, but I, you know, I would do anything for Mo. So I went again, open minded, but not believing it would work. W willing to try, but not believing it would work. And, um, the nutritionist put me on a high protein, low calorie diet. And I'd never done a low calorie diet before. And, <clears throat> over 14 months, I lost 130 pounds, 135 wow. pounds. Yeah. And it, it changed it. That changed everything. And I, I will say if I didn't do the work with Phil first, I don't believe that the diet would have worked. It was sort of a, a combination of things in order. It was like the metabolism got turned on. I started being in tune with circadian rhythm um, I was stimulating my aerobic system every day, um, and was, I built a base and then with, with the right diet was able to drop the weight quickly. Well, what's, what's so interesting about that. And I, I have a couple of more questions about what the nutritionist prescribed, but is that in my experience with say tens of thousands of readers following yeah. various diets, including yeah. the slow carb diet, it makes perfect sense because you were, you were adding things in, in the beginning, as opposed to having everything prohibited you're adding elements in. And then once you've added those lifestyle components, uh, at that point, you were able to, to change the, uh, the diet and then experience the, uh, wow, that is hot. <laughs> it is hot. Yeah. I was going to say, even with, even with Phil though, yeah. I changed my diet. It just was, you know, like almond butter was something that I was allowed to eat. Yeah. Because in Phil's world, almond butter is healthy. Right. So I probably ate a third of a jar of almond butter right, every exactly. day. Exactly. That's my issue with things like almond butter. These yeah. Do it was these just domino foods. You have exactly. Them. So so the idea of uh, Phil has a belief, and so many people have a belief that calories don't count, and I understand that. But if you eat ten thousand calories a day, <laughs> right, <laughs> you're probably going to gain weight. You're not going to lose weight. Exactly. So it's like there there is a point. Absolutely. Where calories do make a difference. Oh, for sure. Yeah. I mean, there are, there are cases where it's, if it's a question of between 4,500 and 5,000 calories, it's like, okay, yes, bourbon calories, sugar calories, and fat calories are very different. But if yeah. you're eating 10,000 calories of almond butter before you go to bed, yeah. which I will do if I have almond butter in my house, yeah, yeah, yeah. then uh, best not to have it in my house. So yeah. with the, when you lost the 130, 140 pounds over that period of time, how many of your meals, how many meals were you eating per day and how many of them were whole food versus liquid? To lose the weight, I was having seven protein shakes a day that were um, high protein. They were like uh, egg protein. J-Rob egg protein was one of them. Uh, Terra's whey, whey protein was another. And um, Did you alternate those or combine them? No. At first, I did only egg, and then the, the whey came later. And uh, at first, I couldn't tolerate the whey. For some reason, the, the whey made me uncomfortable. Once I lost a bunch of weight, I could eat the whey. Um, so egg was first. That makes that also makes sense. I mean, having any amount of lactose or dairy reintroduced after being vegan for, for such a long period of time. Yeah. I, a lot of people have noticed who say try to reintroduce animal proteins feel sick, but it's because they, they lack the enzymes at that point after, say, 10 years of not consuming meat yeah. to digest it properly. Uh, do you want to do an ice round or do you want me to do an ice round? Cause I feel like I'm getting close. Yeah. I'd say, why don't, uh, why don't you do an ice round and then I'll do an ice round because okay. you're at higher elevation. I'm sitting on the floor for those people who can't see. <laughs> ah. Ah. Ooh. Ooh. Yeah. 
Yeah, this is no joke. Oh my it's god! Not even two hundred. It's not even two hundred. It's about one hundred and ninety. Holy crap! One hundred ninety-five degrees in here. All right. So by uh, the end, hopefully, we'll be up to about two twenty. Oh, good lord! Two twenty. That's uh, yeah. That's a well-done steak right there. <laughs> it's very well done. <laughs> All right. I will hang out in here, and I will see you out there in a minute. I'm holding both mics now. I'm sitting on the floor. Two containers of water, and I have a Russian spa hat on. Uh, they make you look somewhat like the Keebler elves, and mine has a lion on it. And uh, I have to only guess the Cyrillic says spa lion, which is appropriate because I think of myself as a spa lion. On a related note, folks, if I do dive heat stroke in here, it's been lovely knowing you, and I'm going to press stop now to save my breath for the ice round. We'll be back. And we're back, refreshed after some, I think we're getting colder adding ice, but it was at a, about 44 degrees Fahrenheit. So Rick, you had uh, mentioned this uh, this gent or doctor or lady from UCLA. Who was that? Uh, the doctor at UCLA who helped me lose the weight's name was Dr. Heber, H-E-B-E-R. And he really, um, he's, of, of everything I tried, nothing ever worked until Dr. Heber. And do you still follow the the general diet, or have you been able to, after losing that weight, uh, modify that? I've I've modified it in that I still um, eat a lot of protein and don't have any grain. Um, yeah, really, not no carbs, and uh, keep. While I probably don't restrict calories as much as I did in the weight loss phase, I'm aware of it. I'm aware of them and don't let them get out of control. Right. You've developed a, a, a sensitivity yeah. and awareness. And for a period of time, I used an app. Um, I think it was called Fitness Pal, if I can remember correctly, where you put in all the food that you eat and it tells you the calories and just kind of keep a log. And what was just helpful about it is if you pay attention to calories for, let's say, a year, you then really have a sense of where the calories are hidden and you just have better habits. Oh, absolutely. Just like if you're trying to get into say ketosis and we're following something like the Atkins diet, for instance, you develop a sensitivity to hidden sugars and absolutely. carbs and uh, sort of net carbohydrate. So I'd love to, to shift gears a little bit and uh, ask you about music producing. Uh, well, let's, let's perhaps take even a step back and, and ask when, when people ask you what you do, how do you answer that question? Um, I don't know how to answer that question. You don't know how to answer it. No. <laughs> so what, what does a, let's uh, perhaps start with definitions then. What does a music producer do for those people not familiar well, with? I don't know what, I don't know what music producers do. Okay. I can tell you. I can tell you what I do. Okay, let's do that. Uh, which is, I help get the best performance from an artist. Help help them pick their material or develop their material, and help set the course for the direction of what they're doing creatively. And uh, how did you end up initially becoming involved with that type of work? Um, I don't know how you usually do, and uh, I guess you can do it in many different ways. Some people might start as a recording engineer and then graduate to a record producer. Some people might be successful artists and then transition into being record producers. Um, in my case, I was just really a fan of music, and I come at it from the point of view of being a fan. What did you study at NYU? I started as a philosophy major, and then after two years, I switched to film and television because all of my friends were in film and television, and it just seemed like more fun. Was it more fun? It was. <laughs> uh, I think it's Natalie Maynard, the, the Dixie Chicks. Yeah. It said, and this is paraphrasing, but that you let music be discovered, not manufactured. And this, this uh, what does she mean by that, or what do you think she means by that? Well, we have a whole process. Depend, uh, you know, it's different for every artist, but um, we we try to 
go on a journey and let the artist discover who they are. And in the process, um, the best art comes from them. It, it's like getting to be their true selves and trying to take away all of the, um, there's so many things that get in the way of the artistic process. For example, any commercial considerations usually get in the way. If you're thinking about making music that's going to get on the radio, chances are you won't be using your, your own voice to its, um, most potent, um, most singular, um, you know, finding the, what your personal gift is. Um, so that's one of the, that's one of many things. Just it's, uh, getting closer to the source and not being distracted by any, uh, any nonsense that would get in the way of the art being as good as it could be. What are other things that get in the way of artists producing their best work? Mm, concern about what other people think, uh, competition, wanting to do better than someone else. Um, let's see what are the things self doubt. Um, ego. What manifestation of ego? Um, if someone thinks that everything they do is great, they might not be willing to edit themselves enough or work hard enough at, um, you know, if, if I can write, if I could write 10 great songs in five minutes each, and those are the best songs and I'm just going to record them and put them out. then those might not be as good as the ones that you develop over a longer period of time. For example, mm -hmm. that might be an egotistical artist who thinks everything I do is just great. When you have the opposite, when you have an artist who is doubting themselves, how do you, uh, help them through that? Um, or what is, uh, what do you recommend? I have a lot. I mean, I just speaking personally, like, I, I have continuous self doubt mm -hmm. <laughs> as a writer. I yeah. Just, I think I, most, I think most artists do. That's more the more typically self doubt is the case. Um, I think if your goal is to be better than you were, you know, if you're competing only with yourself, it's a more realistic, um, it's a more realistic place to be. You know, if you say, I'm, I don't want to write songs unless I could write songs better than the Beatles. It's, it's a hard road. But if you say, I want to write a better song tomorrow than the song I wrote yesterday, that's a realistic, that's something that can be done. And if you write a better song than you wrote yesterday, every day, then you continue to get better and better and better. And it really is small steps. And, um, and, also trying not to, um, trying not to think too much because so much of it is more of a, um, the job is, it's more emotion and heart work than it is head work. It's like the, the head comes in after to look at what the heart has presented and to organize it. But the initial inspiration comes from a different place and it's not the head and it's not an intellectual activity. It's, uh, it's more of a, um, it's more inspiration. So the key first is to really do whatever activities you can to tune into inspiration and things like meditating help and, um, diving into art in general, it doesn't have to be even your modality. I mean, going to museums and looking at beautiful art can help you write better songs, reading great novels, reading great, great works of art. Um, seeing a great movie could inspire a great song, reading poetry. Um, so I would say being in submerging yourself in great art and the, the more you can do to get out of the mode of competition 
where you're looking at what other people are doing and wanting to be better than them or be inspired by them. I'd say the only, the only way to use the inspiration of other artists is if you submerge yourself in the greatest works of all time, which is a great thing to do. You know, like if you listen to the greatest music ever made, that would be a better, uh, a better way to work through to find your own voice to matter today than listening to what's on the radio now and thinking I want to, you know, compete with this. Right. So it's more of like a stepping back and looking at a, a, a bigger picture than what's going on at the moment. As someone, uh, speaking as someone who is not very well versed with music, I don't feel highly literate when it comes to music. I enjoy music, but, uh, hanging out with, with you and Neil Strauss, certainly I, I feel like I'm lacking perhaps a vocabulary <clears throat> to, uh, uh, and a lot of references. Are there any, for people who feel like they're in my shoes, are there any particular albums, uh, that you would, you could offer as a, as a starting point? Not the end all be all, but just as a, as a starting point for appreciating, uh, good world class contemporary music, meaning not necessarily could be classical music, but are there any recommendations? Yeah, you I would, give? I would just start by listening to the, the greats, which you can look at, like, um, if you look at, search online for Mojo's top 100 albums of all time or Rolling Stone's top 100 albums or um, any trusted sources, top 100 albums and start listening to what, you know, what are, what are considered the greats. It's a good place to start. And uh, are, are there any particular stories that you have that come to mind of uh, Experiences outside of the medium of music, say a specific film or a specific trip or a specific book that catalyzed a breakthrough in the work that you did. Let me think about that for a sec. Yeah, I, I wouldn't say breakthrough um, because it's a more it's a more personal thing than that, so it doesn't come as much from the outside. Yeah. But I get inspiration every day, you know, every day from either what I'm reading or watching a sunset or the, you know, the noticing the amount of birds that fly overhead and what they look like in their different shapes and paying attention or hearing the sound of the waves. Um, all of those things speak to me looking at the horizon. Um, they all speak to me. And um, so much of the work we try to do is to create something with the natural balance that we see in nature. That That's sort of the, per the perfect version of, you know, if you can make a piece of music that can take your breath away as much as a beautiful sunset, you've done well. So, um, you know, any opportunity to see dolphins swim or see, you know, see something beautiful. That's not your run of the mill experience, or even could be a beautiful cloud filled sky. Um, or, you know, on a particularly clear night when you can really see lots of stars, those are, they're all inspiring things and, um, help turn on the muse of recognizing, um, kind of a, a, a greater vision of either what's possible or what's beautiful than, you know, something that you see in a magazine that's, you know, advertisement that's there to entice you to buy it. Right. And uh, was, can you talk a little bit about the, when you realized that you were good at working with musicians or music? When did, uh, when did uh, that happen? Yeah. When did that happen? And, and are there any particular, whether it's instances or artists where you're like, wow, I think I might actually have a knack for this. Well, I started r right from the beginning. I started having a lot of success and it, and it, it um, I did it. I, I really made music as a hobby while I was in college and thought I would have a real job. And then I would make music as my hobby. And, um, and I thought I would have a job to support my music habit. <clears throat> and then the first album I produced was, um, by LL Cool J. He was 16 at the time. And I think it cost us about $8,000 to record and sold 
900,000 copies. <laughs> and that was a good start. <laughs> that is a good and start. And then the second one was um, Beastie Boys, which I think sold, I don't know, 9 or 10 million. And um, from then on, like, just a lot of records sold a lot right from the beginning. So it... Um, It be, I, I'll say it took a long time for me to understand that that doesn't always happen. You know, it was an <laughs> unusual series of events. But after a long time of having a lot, working with a lot of artists and seeing a lot of success, it it became clear that um, I could support artists in doing good work, and people seemed to appreciate it. What are what are the, some of the ways that? Uh, what are some of the things or characteristics that make you perhaps different from other people who work with musicians? It's hard to know because I don't know so well what other people do, but I, I, I don't think we do the same thing. And I think um, there are some producers who um, make beats for artists. And um, there was a time that I did that early in, early in my career. I did that. Um, still on occasion we'll do it if, you know, if it, if it makes sense with the, the project that I'm doing. Um, I think it's unusual that I get to work in lots of different genres and get to make heavy metal records and rap records and country records and spiritual records, all, all different kinds. It's, I think that's unusual and just lucky and, I think that might come from the fact that I come from it from that fan perspective. And I, I like all kinds of music and I get to, um, examine them. And, and, and the fact that I've been able to work on so many different kinds of music over such a long period of time gives me a good perspective. Cause when I come into a new project, it's not, it's, it's rare that I'm going to the studio to work on another of what I was just working on. So let's say, for example, I was a heavy metal producer and all I did for the last 30 years was produce heavy metal. I don't know how fresh those records would be today, but now if I get to produce a heavy metal record, like the last one I did, I guess would be the last black Sabbath album. It was really fun because I hadn't made a record like that in a long time. And, and it was a brand new experience. And That's I was, uh, 13, 13 was the last one. Yeah. And, um, that was a great experience. Really fun. Never worked with those guys before and we had a great time. So I'm not sure I ever told you the first time I ever saw the name Rick Rubin was actually on the inside of a an audio cassette. It was the first heavy metal album I ever bought, which was Rain and Blood. Oh, it's a good one. <laughs> and I just remember that's a really good one. Not having is is pre internet, of course. Yes. And I I was just told by my friends, you have to, you will love heavy metal. You should listen to heavy metal. Yeah. And I asked what the hardest heavy metal was yeah. that could possibly be found, and Rain and Blood came uh, to the lips of those I asked. And, uh, <laughs> and I just remember listening to, I think it's angel of death, the first track on that and going, Oh my God, what have I gotten myself into? Yeah. And just fell in love with that band. But how did you go from hip hop to say Slayer? It's, it, it's, uh, stylistically so different. It yeah. would seem, but how did Slayer come about? Yeah. As I said, it, it, because I was coming about it with no technical skill, mm -hmm. It's not like I knew about hip hop or I knew about heavy metal. I was a fan of music and I loved heavy metal and I loved hip hop. So it was more that coming at it from this appreciation and as a fan, knowing what I wanted to hear, knowing that, you know, it, especially in the case of Slayer, Slayer were an underground metal band who had two albums out on an independent label and were kind of considered, you know, the heaviest band in the world. And when we signed them, there was this terrible fear that Slayer now doing their first album for a major label, it was going to, you know, they were going to sell out. Get and watered they, down. Yeah. And which happens all the time. And then the album that we made, Rain and Blood, was much harder and worse <laughs> than anything that anyone ever heard before. And, um, and it really did come from that, you know, I liked, I always liked extreme things and they were extreme and I wanted to, maximize it. I didn't want to water down, you know, the, the idea, the idea of, um, watering things down for a mainstream audience. It, it, I don't think it applies. I think people want things that are really passionate and the best version of that they, they could be. And often the best version they could be is not for everybody. You right. Know, the best, 
the best art divides the audience where you, you know, if you put out a record and half the people who hear it absolutely love it and half the people who hear it absolutely hate it, you've done well because it's pushing that, that boundary. If everyone thinks, oh, that's pretty good, why bother making it? You know, it's sort of, um, doesn't, it doesn't mean much. Lost in the, the slipstream of time almost as soon as it comes out. I'm going to do a round of ice if that's all right. Absolutely all right. Let's do some more ice and we'll be back. <laughs> Okay, we are we are back, and I'd lo- I'd love to talk a little bit about, say, for instance, LL Cool J versus Slayer. Is the way in which you work with those two groups of creatives, or in the case of LL Cool J, I don't know how many people were in- involved on his side, but is uh, is there a different approach when giving feedback when trying to cultivate yeah, I would their say ability? It's it's really different with every single artist, and it's. Um you spend time with the artists, you get to know them. And if you, if you listen to people, if you really listen to what people say, usually they, um, they tell you everything. If you really listen and pay attention to what people are saying, they'll let you know a lot of stuff. And, um, I just really pay attention to what people say. And through that, I, can then reflect back um, thoughts that they've told me about themselves that they don't know about themselves <laughs> and um, allow them to unlock those doors to to get to the places they want to go artistically. Are there any particular examples of that or, uh, or a story that you could share? Hmm. Uh, the, the the first story that comes to mind isn't related to my music work, but it's related to our friend Neil and um, just the the journey the journey that led to his new book that that's about to come out um, started through him complaining about something going on in his life that uh, he thought was something that he wanted in his life and. I don't think that he knew that the thing that he wanted was making him unhappy. And through that conversation, he decided to examine that. So that'd be an example. It'd be the same, same thing as that. That's the first one that came right. to mind, maybe because we both know Neil. Right. Uh, now you seem very, obviously, philosophical, uh, philosophically minded, very calm. Uh, and, uh, I should thank you also, uh, you and a friend named Chase Jarvis, actually, uh, he's a world-class photographer, the people who got me into meditation uh, consistently with TM. Great. So thank you for that. But have you always been very calm? And uh, I mean, does, you seem very unperturbed, very unfazed by, by anything that I've observed. <laughs> is, that, is, that, is, is that an illusion? Is, or have you always been that way? Um, I'm very lucky in that I learned to meditate when I was young. So I started meditating when I was 14 and I meditated, um, a lot for a long time. And through that, I think it has really, um, even, even though I'm not always calm, uh, on the inside, it has at least given me an air of calm and maybe uh, comparative to other people, I'm probably come. I know sometimes internally I can get um, disrupted. <laughs> what do you do when you get disrupted? Uh, I try to do something like uh, often um, exercise will make me feel better. Meditating will make me feel better. The ice bath is the greatest of all. King of mood um, elevators. It's just the magic sauna ice back and forth at the end of, at the end of the fourth or fifth or sixth round of being in an ice tub. There is nothing in the world that bothers you. <laughs> That's true. Yeah, it's very it's true. Just like the world's a great place. <laughs> <laughs> what, what are the types of things that, uh, disrupt you? Are there any particular patterns? Hmm. 
Hmm. I would say usually, um, like work things or political related, you know, political type things related to work could really bother me. Just, um, they don't fit into my, into my realm of, uh, the way I look at life. So, the, so I get surprised by those things and just having to manage, say the various relationships on the, uh, within a, a label or something like that. Yeah. I would say more like dealing with business people mm-hmm. can, can often like, wow, you really think that you really want to do things that way. It's like it's surprising. <laughs> <laughs> it, how do you, uh, how have you designed what what are some of the ways in which you've designed your life to say not have to contend with as much of that as possible well i always um f- really try to s- focus my life around art so i consider my job even though there are other parts of my job i consider my real job the reason i'm here is to sit with artists, talk to artists, help artists be better at what they do. Um, and if I'm not doing it with an artist, I'm doing it with something else. So I, I, my goal is to make things as good as they could be. Either make, um, what, whatever it is. I mean, I've, I'm to the point of where I've gone into friend, visit friends in their office and I rearrange the furniture in their office because I'm <laughs> insane. <laughs> you know, it would really look better if you, you know, if you move these things this way and you could see the sun coming in through the window here. And if you open these blinds and turn this around, this place would feel much more comfortable. When you think of the word successful, who is the first person who comes to mind? It's not, it's not such an easy question to answer because I mean, so many things go into what makes someone successful. What are some of those things? Um, I would start with, um, somebody who's happy. You know, I know a a great many people who are financially successful and not happy. So I would rule all them out to start with. Um, let's see. It's not coming so easily. I have to think about that and we'll come back. We can come back to it. How do you, this is a big question, but I'll, I'll ask a very self-interested question. So I'm 37. Of course, we've both spent a lot of time around Neil Mm -hmm. (laughs) and uh, I'm not going to spoil the, uh, the secret because Neil would have going to apoplectic shock, but, uh, the next book I'm looking forward to. I just thought of a couple of examples of people who are successful. Let's do it. A, A good example of someone who's successful is Don Wildman. Our friend from the beach, he's, uh, who I, uh, whom I still have not met. Yeah, okay, he's amazing. Eight, he's eighty years old. He's um, did twenty three pull ups on the beach the other day. He's uh, in the senior Olympics. He retired in his fifties because he wanted to spend his days enjoying life and exercising. And um, he's one of the most inspiring uplifting, um, great, successful people on so many levels, on so many levels. Um, he'd be, he'd be probably the first one I think of. Laird's another great example of someone who I would think of as successful. He's a successful human being. And this is Laird Hamilton. Laird Hamilton. Um, for those people who are not familiar with, with Laird, uh, pretty much I'd say, uncontroversially thought of as the king of big wave surfing, uh, among, among other things. Yeah. I mean, it's not uncommon to hear him referred to as the greatest athlete on earth. Um, he's real, you know, so many athletes of so many disciplines think of him as the best athlete. (laughs) Also a king of, of steam rooms (laughs) and ice pads. I first started doing the sauna and the ice with Laird. (coughs) Anyway, successful someone who enjoys their life, um, is great at what they do, is curious and continually pushing forward and wanting to be better than they were yesterday without 
a, uh, without beating themselves up about it. And what are, uh, uh, Don, Don is, is in, his name has come up so many times. What, what are some of the things that you've learned or picked up from him and uh, adopt for yourself? He, he's just seems so positive and so, um, it, nothing, it seems like nothing gets to him. He's, um, he can, he can push through anything that's in his way and all the time with a smile on his face and, um, a positive outlook and, uh, and a curious nature, you know, how, I don't know how many people that are 80 that, uh, every time you meet them, talk, tell you, you know, teach you something about something new they've learned because they're so curious about a great article or this great book and you have to read this book and you have to go to see this movie and you have to do this. And, um, you know, we just came back from snowboarding in Alaska and you got to go see, it was like, it was unbelievable. And just, it's, it, he's got a wild life. That's inspiring. I've, I've, in the last, I'd say three or four years, particularly after my, my health scare last year with Lyme disease and everything that came of that, tried to surround myself not just with the extremely young athletes and performers, but, uh, for instance, this, uh, Polish gentleman and his wife, both of whom are world record holders in Olympic weightlifting. But what's, what's so fascinating is how rel- relatively injury free and mobile they still are and they're in their i'd say early 60s at this point amazing and i've tried to really tried to spend more time in the last few years modeling what those people do uh do you have a book or books that you've gifted often to other people um there there are many um the first one that comes to mind is uh the Tao Te Ching. it's this Stephen Mitchell translation of the Tao Te Ching. That's, um, what's great about it is it's 81 short, uh, pieces that could be, you could look at them as poems that if you were to read the book today, you would get one thing from it. And if you pick it up in two years and read it again, it would mean something entirely different. And, um, and always on the money, you know, always, what you need to read at that period of time. So it's, uh, it's a magic book in that way that it, uh, it always fits. I actually took, God, this is bringing back a memory. I took a, an entire class on the Tao Te Ching at uh, Princeton when I was an undergrad in East Asian studies. And it seems on some level that that book does what you do for musicians, meaning it uh, sort of reflects back truths that they were not aware of themselves or they could not verbalize themselves. Uh, any other books come to mind? Uh, another one that's really nice is a book about meditation called Wherever You Go, There You Are, which is by uh, John Kabat-Zinn. And it's a great, it's a great book if you've never meditated and if you've been meditating for 50 years, if you read, if you read this book either way, you'll, you will care more about meditation, become a better meditator and, um, just give insight into why we do it and what the benefits are. Do you have any favorite, uh, any favorite movies or documentaries? Um, I watch lots of documentaries. Let me think of what's, what's a uh, favorite. Just watched one the other night that was spectacular. New, um, uh, Nick cave, the English. Well, I guess he's Australian he lives in England um, musician has a, there's a new documentary that's an unusual documentary because it's part documentary and part, I guess not. <laughs> you have to see it. Yeah. Uh, but it's called 20,000 days on earth. 20,000 days on earth. Yeah. So that was the last one that just really like, wow, how great is that? Um, are there any points, uh, have you had any points of, of overwhelm in your length, in your, uh, in your length, in your, <laughs> that's an odd question. <laughs> I think the heat's getting to my head in your, uh, in heat's, your career. The heat's getting to you. Yeah, the heat's getting to me. <laughs> I have to switch Wonder hands my because eye. my hand is burning. <laughs> <sighs> okay. Uh, do you experience overwhelm or have you? Yes, I definitely experience overwhelm. Too, yeah. Over, too much going on at one, at one time. 
or um, often it's it's uh, self imposed. Um, I I make it a point to um, always be there uh, as best as I can be for the artists that I work with, and sometimes uh, their needs can overtake my own needs, and then I feel overwhelmed because I want to be there for them, and then I feel like oh, I'm not taking care of myself. So finding that balance. What do you What do you do in those situations when you when you come to that realization? When I realize it, I'll usually talk to the artist about it and and um, and explain the situation and you know look for. Uh, th- I would say w- any situation that feels uh, sticky, usually <laughs> through talking about it with the person that it feels sticky with, almost always it uh, it eases very quickly. And usually brings you closer together. And do you ex- do you explain the, situa- the situation the way that you just uh, described it to me, or it's what it, what is the actual? It just depends on the on the case. But it, but I might say you know I feel really overwhelmed now. This is what's going on with me. Um, can we talk about this later, or can mm-hmm. you know can we readdress this? Is that okay? Or usually talk about it. How are you feeling? It's getting hot. <laughs> uh, you tell me. I'll let, I'll let you call the uh, call the, the the rotation of the guards when we go to ice. But I am I'm very curious. I, I remember uh, seeing your you yes. myself. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think this is a fine idea. I will say. Um, I will absolve myself of responsibility for hot objects, but uh, <laughs> the uh, your cameo in uh, 99 Problems. Yes. How did that come about? Uh, I had produced the song for Jay, and then when it was time to make the video, um, a friend of mine, Mark Romanek, who's a great video maker, made the video. And um, I think it was Mark's idea. He said, why don't we get Rick in the video? And Jay agreed, and then... They called and asked if I would come, and I love Jay. He's a really great guy, and I thought it would be fun. Uh, what uh, What are you proudest of as it relates to that track? Um, if it comes to mind, I know you've worked yeah, with I a think, lot of tracks. Yeah, I think that uh, just the fact that Jay is one of the most you know important artists in the world, and that that's one of his most popular songs and that we got to do it together is really great how were you how did you become involved with that song or were you involved with the entire album um i was involved with that song we went into the studio together he it was his last it was going to be his last album the black album his retirement album and he asked his 10 favorite producers to each do one song and we went into the studio that was the first time we worked together and we um we spent a week in the studio trying different things and then eventually came upon this track and uh, in the experimentation and he loved it. And then the, the words came to him sort of magically. He sat in the back of the room, listened to the track over and over and over again. And after about a half hour, jumped up and said, I've got it and ran into the other room and did the vocals <laughs> I, I, without writing anything down. So I've heard this about him before where uh, at some point I, I heard a story that he, he wrote basically gibberish down on a piece of paper because someone trying to supervise him earlier in his career was so worried that he wasn't taking the recording session seriously, but in fact he didn't write anything down at all. It was just to put them at ease <laughs> yeah. and then freestyled the entire thing. Is that generally how he operates? That's how he does it, yeah. That's mind boggling. Yeah. He's super talented and just a great, great person. Really one of my favorite people. What do you like about him? Uh, everything. He's, uh, humble. He's honest. He's, um, he's a deep soul. You know, he looks at things deeply, understands them deeply, is caring. And, um, he's just a, you know, first rate person. I think I'm going to get in the ice. All right. Time to move to the ice. And we'll hit pause. <laughs> it was right. <laughs> oh, <geez. laughs> 
crazy. <laughs> crazy is right. It adds up. It does, adds up. it does add up. That was a particularly chilly <laughs> ice bath. It's now lower than the minimum measurement, which is 40 degrees. So I feel like uh, all my skin below my neck is just contracted by 30%. It's a good feeling. And uh, you, you'd mentioned this briefly when we were coming in, but who is who is the person who introduced you to using a sauna? Yeah, the, fir- the first sauna that I was ever in was uh, a, f- a local friend of ours, Chris Chelios, who's a hockey player, and he was the... Um, he had the longest hockey career, professional hockey career of, of anyone ever. He continued playing professionally until he was 48 years old. And, um, all the people on the other teams that he was facing at the time were in their twenties. So he's really an unbelievable athlete. And he, um, has done sauna every day of his life for the last, you know, since he's been playing and he could, he, believes the reason he had the longevity in the sport and the reason he never got sick and was able to never miss a game and to play for, you know, such a long career was all due to the sauna every day. And he used uh hot sauna. He was not alternating between hot and cold. He did hot and cold, but he wouldn't necessarily always use an ice bath. He would do cold showers if not. Um, but he would do, 15 or 20 minutes in the sauna, cold shower, 15 or 20 minutes in the sauna, round and round. And how were you introduced to the ice baths? Uh, the ice baths came from um, Joachim Noah, who's um, my girlfriend's nephew. And he um, he bought an ice tub for Laird because he, Laird started doing the sauna after, after Chris started the sauna. Uh, with our group, we would do it on the beach. Chris has a sauna on the beach, so we would do the sauna and even in the wintertime and then jump into the ocean. And that was how we did the hot and the cold. And then Joachim suggested we started using the ice tub. Um, and then we started doing that, and that was, it took it to a whole new level. And you've done some very unusual training that sounds terrifying to me underwater right and are, do you continue to do the yeah, underwater training with weights yeah that's something that we do with laird we'll do like um 50 pound dumbbells 14 feet underwater and um it's it's an interesting experience it's a lot like getting into the ice bath like if you're not used to getting into a, an ice bath most people if you say get into a tub of ice they they uh react negatively <laughs> they panic <laughs> and, uh, they panic and when you're underwater holding weights, your brain goes crazy and it, it, you know, it relates to, oh, it's like weight underwater, you die. That's like, uh, cement shoes. Right. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> so we do all these different exercises, with weights underwater, and it's really interesting. And do you, what do some of those, and keep in mind, folks, do this, <laughs> don't do this without supervision and <laughs> talk to your doctor. But the, uh, what, what is, the technique look like or well, an example it started it started um laird has a pool that you can start in the shallow end and walk down to the deep end and then up the center of the pool there's a staircase in underwater so it started with holding heavy weights walking from the shallow end into the deep end and obviously there's a point where you have to take a big breath and hold it and then you walk down into the deep end and then you turn around and you walk up the stairs and make it before you run out of breath. And each time you do it, you would make wider and wider circles and get used to being under longer and longer. And then we started adding, once we were completely submerged, start adding maybe curls or shoulder presses um, and doing those underwater. And then one day, after we'd been doing this for about a year, Laird came into the... uh, the gym the next day and he said i had a dream last night that if we use lighter weights they'll be heavy enough to keep us down but light enough where we could get up where we could jump up to the top in in the in the deep end in the deep end so you'd be down in the deep end so now instead of doing one rep and recovering which was all we could do before you know you could do one round basically and then be in the shallow end and recover. 
um, we started doing these exercises of jumping. So we'd start with maybe 15 pound dumbbells and you would hold two 15 pound dumbbells, jump into the deep end, sink to the bottom, um, and jump as hard as you can, throw your arms over your head and then kind of do one stroke, pulling your arms down to your sides while holding the dumbbells. And it was just enough to get your head out and you'd gasp for a breath and then you'd sink. <coughs> and we would do that over and over and over again. And, you know, at first maybe the, the goal would be to try to get 10 in a row and it'd be really a big deal when we could do 10 in a row. And then, you know, over time we worked up to being able to do a hundred in a row and then doing it with heavier weights. And then since then, Laird's come up with maybe, I don't know, 50 different exercises that we do with weights underwater, either underwater or in water. And um, it's he, wild. He dreams up some really fascinating, not only exercises, but devices. Uh, yeah, for those people who haven't amazing. seen the, the foil board, is that what it is? With the, the foil board's amazing. The foil board, yeah. So so people can he Google foil board. He invented stand-up paddling, really. You know, he invented stand-up paddling. He invented toe-in surfing. Um, he's an amazing, he's got an amazing, um, analytical mind. Do you think, uh, did he develop that in any particular way? The mind? The analytical mind. I think he's, I think he's, um, he, I think he's very mechanical to start with. I think starts with that and, um, very curious and very hardworking. And he's willing to try things and, and fail at things to be able to get to, you know, to be able to do something. So he, you know, the first day I went to his gym, um, I couldn't do one push up. And really it was through his, uh, his belief and his inspiration that I was able to learn all the different things that I was able to learn with him. And, I remember he showed me one exercise and I couldn't do it at all. And I said, I can't do that. And he said, no, don't say you can't do it. Say you haven't done it yet. And then he'd say, okay, now let's divide it into three pieces. Do the first third of the exercise and I could do the first third. And I'd do the last third of the exercise and I could do that. And I'd do the middle third by itself and I could do that. He's like, okay, now put the first two pieces together and I could do that. And then put the second and third piece together and I could do that. And then eventually I could do the whole exercise, but at first it seemed impossible, but he walked me through it and, um, broke it down for you. Yeah. Just taught me how to see past the, um, the limitations that I put on myself. What was the exercise? I'm sorry, do you recall what that was? That might've been a, uh, like a jump through, like, it would be like, uh, like a burpee with weights where you would, uh, like you do a shoulder press mm -hmm. and then you put the weights down on the ground and then hold them, hold the dumbbells, jump back into a push up position, then jump up and slide your legs forward through. Right. Right. And then jump up into a squat position and then lift up. And that would be one, one round. That's an intense movement. <laughs> what are some of the, the physical experiments that you're doing these days? Um, or training protocols that you're experimenting with? There's always so many. I have to think of what's, what's new and different. <laughs> um, I've been doing hyperbaric oxygen, and I really like that. That's in a chamber? Yeah. I do, uh, the Wim Hof breathing technique. I just started doing, there's a Wim Hof 10 week course. You could check online, W-I-M-H-O-F. Just started learning that. He's a fascinating guy. Yeah. He's really into ice. Oh, you can see. <laughs> yeah. I've, uh, never seen anyone more tolerant of ice. Yeah. I think he has the world record for sitting in a box, basically a, cu a cube of ice. Yeah. And I think the he climb Mount Everest just in swim trunks. And he has some incredible, yeah. uh, thermo regulatory capabilities. Yeah, That's very he impressive. Ran a, um, he ran a marathon in the, um, in the desert with no water 
That was another one. Yeah. So like just the two extremes of the heat or the cold. The guy's a monster. Yeah. I, I really want to get him on the podcast at some point. He'd be a good one. Uh, let's see what else. Those are the ones that come to mind at the moment. What, uh, how do you, just as Laird did for you, when you are working with an artist who believes they can't do something or it's just hitting that wall. What are some of the ways that you help them get past that? Um, usually I'll give them, um, like homework, like a, a small doable task. I give you an example. There was an artist I was working with recently who was, who hadn't made an album in a long time and was struggling with struggling with finishing anything. And, um, and just had this, like, a, it was a version of a writer's block, but it was a, um, I don't know, hard to explain what it was. But I would give him very doable homework assignments that almost seemed like a joke. You know, like, t- tonight I want you to write one word, you know, one word in this song that needs five lines that you can't finish. I just want one word that you like by tomorrow do you think you would come up with one word and usually you'd be like yeah i think i can do one word and then just very quickly by chip by breaking it down into pieces like i learned from laird and chipping away um one step at a time you can you can really get through anything yeah breaking it down into yeah, manageable I bites. on the beach we had a um we had a a zip line, not a zip line, a, um, you know, the, the, the beam that you balance on. Oh, a slack line. Slack line. And, um, Laird was pretty good at it in the beginning, but had never done it before. And he would work for hours. He would just be there hour after hour after hour falling off and getting back on, falling off and getting back on. And then of all of the group of people, he was by far the first one who was able to do it. And it wasn't because he just, naturally was gifted at it he's he knows that anything he sets his mind to learn to do if he focuses and just continues to you know not mind falling off and not thinking he's supposed to be good out of the box learning to be able to do it and that's how you learn things so it's i i also will say that after having the weight problem that i had for so long and then finally finding the solution and making the change it really makes me believe that anything's possible. You know, we can learn, we can train ourselves to do absolutely anything. It's really just getting the right information. If we get, get the right information, we can learn to do anything, whatever it is. Now, it doesn't mean we can necessarily, um, be the best in the world at something, but we can be our best at that thing. Right. The best version of ourselves. Yeah. And do things that, never dreamed of as possible, you know, possible for us. What, uh, what advice would you give? And uh, I'll ask this for a couple of different ages, but, uh, I'll start with uh, your 20 year old self. What advice would you give your 20 year old self? If any, try to have more fun. Why do you think you weren't having as much fun as you could have at that point? Mm, I think I was more driven and, um, I I don't know. I want to say almost like I felt like I had something to prove. I don't know if I did have something to prove, but I felt like, I felt like, um, doing the work was the most important thing in the world as opposed to doing the work and enjoying the process and you know, feeling what it was being able to step back and see what it was, you know, not just be so deeply into it that, um, you know, I feel like I missed a lot of years of my life because I was just in dark room working on music, you know, seven days a week for probably 20 years. Wow. I I recall that makes me think of a story from, uh, Neil Gaiman, the writer, when he, I think it was with the success of Sandman, and he was in a huge line of readers who wanted signatures and fans who wanted to tell him stories, and uh, Stephen King pulled him aside and just said, 
enjoy it. Yeah. <laughs> and he didn't. He didn't, uh, he was too caught up in the, in the flow. Uh, what about your 30 year old self? What advice would you give to your 30 year old self? I guess, um, I would probably tell myself something that I, that still might apply to me today. Um, I wouldn't have known it at all then. I know it now. I just still, it's not second nature, but, um, to be kinder to myself because I, I think I beat myself up a lot and, um, because I expect a lot from myself, I'll be hard on myself and, um, I don't know that I'm doing anyone any good by doing that. <sighs> yeah, that's advice that I need to to give myself as well. When do you tend to beat yourself up? <clears throat> I, I've 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 made somewhat of a uh, sport of it. It would seem. Yeah, it, it it can happen. You know, anytime I can come up with anything that I could be doing to further something, and didn't already think of it and didn't already do it, I might beat myself up about <laughs> why, you know, why have I not done that? Now, something, something I struggle with that I'd love to get your two cents on and, uh, is related to this, which is on one hand, I, I don't want to beat myself up. On the other hand, I feel like the perfectionism that I have has enabled me to do, achieve whatever modicum of success I've uh, been able to achieve. And I've, I've heard stories and you can correct me if I'm wrong, but about, for instance, uh, ZZ top and La Futura and, uh, you know, how they worked on it with you from, I guess, uh, I want to say what, 2008 to 2012, something like that, but how they realized the value of, uh, you wanting the art to be as perfect as it could be or the best that it could be and taking whatever time and pains necessary to make that possible. Uh, so I'd love to hear your thoughts on that because it's, it's something that I continually struggle with. I want to be easier on myself, but I, I worry that if I do that, I will lose whatever magic, if there is such a thing that enables me to, to do what I do. Yeah. I think that ultimately the, I think that's a myth. <laughs> and I think that, um, your take on things is specific to you and it's not because of your, you've, it's, it's almost like you've won the war and to accept the fact that you've won the war, you have broken through to now you have an audience. People are open to hear, hear what you are interested in, what you learn, what you're interested in learning about <coughs> and what you want to share. And, um, you can, you can do that without killing yourself. And that killing yourself won't be of service either to you or to your audience. Hey, again, guys. <laughs> All right. You know what? Let's, uh, let's, uh, this is, this has been great. I need ice as well. Let's, let's call a close to this. Is there any last parting advice or comment that you'd like to make before we sign off? I think it's too, it's too hot for me to know what's even, I don't know what's happening. <laughs> what's now. up or down? Yeah. <laughs> very confused at the moment but i know that this ice bath is going to change everything for the better <laughs> all right well on the on that note uh thanks so much rick thank you we will both get some ice <laughs> i'll let you get out first Tim Ferriss Show is brought to you by Onnit. I have used Onnit products for years. If you look in my kitchen, in my garage, you will find Alpha Brain, chewable melatonin for resetting my clock when I'm traveling, kettlebells, battle ropes, maces, steel clubs. It sounds like a torture chamber, and it kind of is. It's a torture chamber for self-improvement. <laughs> and you can see all of my favorite gear at onnit.com forward slash Tim. That's O-N-N-I-T dot com forward slash Tim. And you can also get a discount on any supplements, food products. I like Hemp Force. I like Alpha Brain. Check it all out on it.com forward slash Tim. This episode is brought to you by 99designs, your one-stop shop for all things graphic design related. I have used 99designs for everything from banner ads to book covers, including sketches and mock-ups that led to The 4-Hour Body, which later became number one New York Times, number one Wall Street Journal. 
And the brainstorming, a lot of it took place with designers from around the world. And here's how it works. Whether you need a t-shirt, a business card, a website, an app thumbnail, whatever it might be, you submit that project and designers from around the world will send you sketches and mock-ups and designs. You choose your favorite and you have an original that you love or you get your money back. It's that straightforward. And many of you who are listening have already used it and created some amazing things that I'll be sharing in the future. But in the meantime, if you want to see some of my competitions, some of the book covers, as well as get a free $99 upgrade, go to 99designs.com forward slash Tim. That's 99designs.com forward slash Tim. And until next time, Thank you for listening.